Hello. This evening you find me in a British Airways Boeing 737 on the ground at Sydney Airport and we're going to do a short flight down to Canberra in Australia. So without further ado, let's have a look at the flight plan on the, the map. I'll turn the AI aircraft off and go and have a look. So you can see we're parked on the ground in Sydney. We are going to depart runway 34 left. We're not going to take any notice of the advice in the little nav map. In fact, I think we can fix that. So select a start position for departure and we'll say 34 left. And OK, and that moves the circle. OK, so we are going to manufacture our own um, departure from Sydney to do some sightseeing. So we're going to fly around the city before heading off down the coast to Canberra and we'll be flying the Razzie 6A arrival into or approach I should say into Canberra and then ILS into the runway so we're going to be playing with some of the systems on the aircraft along the way but it should be a nice quick flight shouldn't take too long in the cruise part of it we're only going to climb out to about 24,000 feet so we'll use the systems available to us to do that quickly Okay, so let's get on with it. So we're inside the aircraft. I've already configured the controller to, to work correctly, so it's something else, something for everybody to remember really when you're switching aircraft in Flight Simulator is to use the controller profiles to make sure that you've got the right controls mapped for a given aircraft. Okay, so the first thing we do in a 737 is go and turn the batteries on. The battery switch is right here, so we can turn it on and close the lid. We can also come down here and we can connect the ground power. So in the MCDU, sorry, the FMC, I've been flying the Airbus recently, you can tell, can't you? So in the FMC, there's an FS Actions menu. And you can go to Ground Services and we can request ground power. So it says Connecting. After a few seconds, it will say, do we want to disconnect it or release it, I guess, which will, you know, implies that it is then connected. So while that's happening, if we look outside, you can see there's the ground power unit that's been connected to the aircraft. And we can see, yeah, it says now release, which means it's connected. OK, so back overhead, we can connect a ground power. So the switch is here to do that. So that switches over immediately to ground power. And next thing we're going to do is go further overhead and turn on the inertial navigation system. So to do that, we turn both of these switches to nav. We wait for these to say align. And then we turn the system above it to heading STS. And that will give us a number of minutes on its display until the inertial navigation system has aligned. OK. Next thing we do, back overhead again. So while we were talking there, you saw things have started to boot up. It takes a while for systems to boot up on an aircraft. There's, you know, there's operating systems and computer systems that are slowly being powered up. So we go and turn the emergency lights to armed. And we close the lid on that. We turn the window heats on and the probe heats on. I'm going through a paper checklist, by the way, so I'll uh, link to it in the description of the video. Then we go down to the FMC and we prepare our flight plan. So if we go to the um, a route page. Actually, let's do this the full way. If we go to the menu page and then go to FMC, then you see this from the start. So this gives you your data on the AIRAC version that the aircraft is loaded with. So then we can go to the position in it. So it's saying nav data is out of date. We don't have to worry about that. And it's saying enter our IRS position. So to do that, we go to POS in it. And you can see there's an empty field here for the IRS position. So we can go to next page because it is what page one of three and on the second page we can see there's the internal gps systems on the left and right of the aircraft so we can choose one of those and that drops it into the scratch pad then we can go previous page and we can drop that into the field and that goes away we are at 
um, Kingsford Smith International in Sydney. The ICAO code is YSSY. So we can fill that into our reference airport. YSSY. That goes into the reference airport and that obviously initialises the system with our position there as well. And then we can go and fill in our route. So notice now they've updated the 737. So we do now get the reference airport showing up in the scratch pad ready to drop into the origin, which is accurate to the real aircraft. And we are going to fly down to Canberra today and the ICAO code for Canberra is Yankee Sierra Charlie Bravo. Yankee Sierra Charlie Bravo. Drop that into the destination. We can make up a flight number if we want. A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. We're just inventing it off the top of our head. We can tell it which runway we are departing on. So we will be leaving Kingsford Smith on 34 left. OK, done. Next, we can go to departure and arrival. So we're going to tell the aircraft. We've programmed where we're flying from and to now. So now we can say how we're going to leave those places. So we are not going to program a departure because we are going to just um, use 34 left and then have manually entered waypoints, which we will get round to in a moment. We will program this RASI 6A approach into Canberra though. So on the arrival, we're coming in ILSZ runway 35. And if we go, you can see we can't see the star that we want, but there's two pages of them. So we go next page, RASI 6A for runway 35. Select it. We don't need a transition. And we go root, activate, execute. Now if we go and look in the legs page now, We've got the beginning of Razzie, but we've got none of the root legs at the start. So this is where we're going to fill in our manual waypoints. So 41 India Kilo Sierra is our first waypoint. 41 India Kilo Sierra. And we insert that as our first waypoint. Oh, it's not in the database. So we just check that. 41 IKS, that's interesting. Why is that not in its database? I wonder if it is having a complaint because it doesn't have a standard instrument departure. Let's go and tell it what runway we're leaving on. We've already said 34 left. So we'll confirm that. We're not going to use a SID though, so we'll just execute that. So let's go back and look in the legs page and try that again. 41 IKS. We can always put HBB if we if we want to. So HBB, let's try this. Yeah, it's behaving now. So then 41 IKS, let's try that again. 41 India Kilo Sierra. No, it doesn't like it. So we'll delete that back away. So we're gonna, f we'll, we'll take off manually knowing that we're gonna turn right. OK, so HPB then NCAS is the next waypoint. E-N-K-A-S. And then we fly down to M-R-B-R. M-R-B-R. And then it's straight down to the beginning of the the um, standard approach route at Razi, so we can pull Razi up over the top of the discontinuity and we can execute that. Okay, so we are not going to program speeds and heights into, uh, into this manual departure, this manually programmed departure. We'll just fly it, you know, and we're going to fly up to um, 24,000 feet. So we'll just manage that ourselves using a flight level change, but we won't actually start climbing until we come around the edge of Sydney. We'll just climb out to a few thousand feet to begin with. OK, so we need to go and program the performance data for the aircraft next. So we've obviously got a route now, but we haven't finished. So we go into the... Oh, I'm, I'm becoming lost myself now. Init reference. 
here we go so the 737 is a lot easier than the Airbus in this regard it calculates most of it for you so we can put in the zero fuel weight and it calculates the gross weight for you and we can put in 24,000 or, or flight level 240 same thing into the altitude put in reserve of a thousand the flight simulator loads the aircraft with 50 percent fuel which is usually fine for this sort of distance cost index 20 and execute that and then we can go to the n1 limit we're not going to change that we can go to takeoff we we'll go for flaps 5 for takeoff we'll copy across the v speeds and the rotate speed we can calculate the center of gravity automatically gives us trim of 5.99 so we'll go and run the trim round to 5.99 so the whole point of doing this if you've not seen the workup videos I've done in the past is we're trimming the aircraft for its current configuration so when we get to the rotate speed on the runway the aircraft doesn't start reacting before time it be it means we'll be in equilibrium as we roll down the runway basically so coming back down to the tablet sorry the um, flight management computer so we don't need to put winds in necessarily so okay I think we're looking good so let's just have a quick look we've got no discontinuities have we Oh no, we've still got one look, so it's a good job I checked. So execute that. Next page. So this is why it pays to double check things. Okay, so you can see that there's our, our route which is going to loop us around, which is perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to do. We can get rid of the master caution, it's just there because we haven't finished configuring the aircraft yet. Okay, so on the master control panel for the autopilot we could also go and program that immediately as well you could do this at any point really on the way to the runway so we're just going to get that ready uh we're taking off runway 35 aren't we uh so yeah we've set our speed for for the auto throttle for the climb out we'll just go for 200 knots we'll set our heading to replicate the direction of travel we'll, we will be on so again, let's just double check that. Is it runway 35 or 34? It's 34. We can actually check on the map. If you had a chart, you could check this. So it's 335 degrees in reality. So let's spin this round. It's the exact opposite of the heading that's on here. So pull this back round to 335. There we go set our altitude we are initially going to climb to what altitude are we at at the moment so I'm going to correct this we're only 20 feet above sea level so let's go for 3,000 feet for our loop around Sydney okay we will enable LNAV immediately oh is it going to not allow us to that's interesting why can't oh because we can't because we haven't got a full flight plan I'm guessing not a major problem we'll go heading select mode when we take off Ah, oh, the reason why we can't do it is we haven't turned the flight directors on of course it isn't there we go so we go and turn on heading select mode and now it lets us we can probably have LNAV now as well nope it still won't let us I imagine LNAV is because we haven't got a SID um okay it will let us do it once we're in the air though We'll do a level change to get to 3,000 feet quickly. Um, and we're good to go with that. Okay, so after configuring the flight, we've already calibrated the barometric pressure for the altimeter. So we go back overhead and we start telling people to sit down, basically, <laughs> so we can get on with operating the aircraft. So the fasten seatbelt sign goes to auto. Your dampers go to on. Cabin pressure, we configure it for the cruise altitude. So our cruise altitude was going to be 24,000, wasn't it? We turn the aft fuel pump number one on because that provides fuel for the APU. 
and we then go and start the APU. So this is the auxiliary power unit, the small jet engine in the back of the aircraft that um, provides electrical power and also primarily the, the compressed air for to, to spin up the, um, the engines. So this needle will come around to about seven and then fall back to four. And when it does so, the center light will come on on the bus transfer, meaning we can switch away from the ground power to using the auxiliary power unit. So we just wait for this needle to spin around and come back to four, and this light will come on. At that point, we flick the middle two switches down on the bus transfer, which takes us away from ground power to using the APU. If we go and actually sit outside, you can see there's heat pouring out of the back of the APU now. So if you ever wondered what that hole is in the back of the aeroplanes, there you go. It's the auxiliary power unit. There we go, the light has just come on. So we can now transfer over. So we've switched over power to the APU. So the ground power is off automatically. So we can come back down into the FMC, press the menu button, go to FS Actions, Ground Services, and we can release ground power now. We don't need it anymore. At the same point, I'm going to check the parking brake is on, which we have to do here in this aircraft. And we can remove the chocks. OK, so that's going to also close the door and pull the stairs away. OK, so overhead again, we turn the anti-collision lights to on. So what this is really all about is telling people nearby that um, we're about to start the engines. Notice the strobes were already on steady. It would appear in the cold and dark state that the 737 is preset with. That switch is left to steady. And what that really means is as soon as you provide power to the aircraft, the lights, the navigation lights come on. Yeah, they're not strobing, they're on steady. So it basically tells ground crews that there are people in the aircraft, they're getting it ready for flight. But as soon as you put the anti-collision lights on, that's really a different game. That's telling the ground crew we're about to start the engines. OK. So how do we go about starting the engines? We turn all of the fuel pumps to on. Makes sense really, doesn't it? We've got the APU running, so we've got compressed air. So now we can turn the APU bleed on, which is over here. OK. And you can notice the duct pressure is rising. You need at least 20 to start the engines. That's interesting. It's gone. It's gone quite low. We'll keep an eye on that. OK, so control six. Oh, we need, to, I've forgotten something. We need to turn the taxi lights to on as well. Oh, sorry, no, I've, I've missed a load out. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Starting the engines now. I've, I've jumped the, um, the start procedure. So, starter for the engine number two to GRD. Ignition on the right side. And you can now see the N2 percentage is coming up. When it gets to 20, we can move the starter for engine number two forwards the start lever. So what that does is introduce fuel. So you will see the fuel flow increase, you'll see the exhaust gas temperature go through the roof and you'll see the N1 or the turbofan speed increase. As soon as this is a fully automated procedure, as soon as it's, it's finished the GRD switch or sorry the, uh, the start switch will go back to off for engine number two. And we'll do that all on its own. You can actually hear it spinning up outside if you listen carefully. There you go. So start switch for engine number one goes to ground as well. And we switch to, or GRD, sorry. Um, and then we switch to left ignition. And again, N2 or the gas turbine on the left side of the aircraft is coming up when it gets to 20. We move the start lever forwards. Fuel flow will increase, exhaust gas temperature will increase, and then the N1 number, the turbofan speed, will increase. And again, that will turn around to off. As soon as we've got both engines running, 
we can transfer power away from the APU over to the engines. So you're kind of lifting the aircraft up by its bootstraps really. You know, the APU gives you the power. The APU is a jet engine to start the jet <laughs> engines. And as soon as they're up and running, they can generate their own electricity, if that makes sense, or generate electricity for the aircraft. Okay, so en engines are running. So we bus transfer over to the engines now. And notice it says APU is now off bus. In other words, it's available, but we're not using it. So we can actually go and turn the APU bleed back off and we can turn the APU off. Okay, so the aircraft is now relying totally on the gas turbines to generate electric. Okay, hydraulic pumps go to on. So this obviously provides the um, oil pressure for the control surfaces. Packs go to auto. So now this is going to vent the hot air from the engines into the cabin and ob obviously also provide compressed air to um, pressurise the cabin. Taxi lights go to on. We're nearly there. So what do we need to do? Just looking around. I need to reconfigure my controls slightly. Um, there we go. Don't worry, the engines are not going to die. They're just going back to idle. I had them running at a, a percentage because I hadn't configured my hardware controls properly, which I have now done. Okay, so we're going to see what the turning circle is like on A737. I'm going to release the parking brake which we can do inside the cockpit. And we're going to ease the, the engines forwards and then full left tiller Okay, while we're doing that, we'll move flaps to five degrees for takeoff. You can see the flaps traveling over here. I think we should be on this line actually. So let's go and join the line. Center our view up slightly. So we're just going to go and taxi out to the runway. Is he coming in here? Okay, we'll pass you on the right. Yeah, he is coming in here. I think we're going to have a head-on with an aircraft in a moment. <laughs> Welcome to the world of AI aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator. You're never quite sure what you're going to get. I love the sound of the um, nose wheel going over the lights. Never get bored of that. So we're going to have an out-of-body experience in a moment as we pass through the cabin of the, the aircraft we are rolling towards. You'll notice we are slowly turning left all the time. That is because there are, is a slight wind from the left, which is pushing the tail right. One of the big problems of the big jets is they have these enormous tails. I'm going to try and turn off here. We don't need the full runway here. 737 has a remarkably short takeoff run. We don't need the full runway. There is someone out there. Should we just keep a watching brief for a moment? 
they're doing? They're taking off the wrong direction. They're taking off with the wind. Can't teach people, can you? Okay. And here we go. All the nutters are in today. So we just done, just done a low pass of the airfield in an airbus by the look of it. Full throttle. V1 and rotate. Gear up. Flaps up. Autopilot engaged. And now we can select LNAV. So we will pull the throttle back and we'll go for the speed mode on the auto throttle. And let's go and have a look outside, shall we, and see some of Sydney rolling past while the aircraft is on autopilot. Harbour Bridge, the Opera House. The dry dock down there with a the warship in it. Okay, let's get this show on the road then, shall we? So we're going to speed up to 250 knots. We're going to take the altitude up to 24,000 feet. And we're going to hit the flight level change button. The aircraft is going to now climb us up to 24,000 feet, all on its own. So you can see us following the departure here. We can increase the range now. You can see top of climb. About 40 miles out. Aircraft's absolutely going for it. Go and look back in here and we can see progress. So we can see Razzie is our next waypoint. That's the approach into Canberra, which we should reach at 23.10. It is now 22.55, so we've got about 15 minutes until we get to the beginning of the approach. It's only a very short flight. That means we stay busy, which is good. Or should I say, busy with a chance to have a coffee. <laughs> so you can see top of climb and top of descent are marked. 
we will change the levels on descent ourselves. We'll fly in and manage it ourselves, which is, gives us something to do. People often say, why don't I use VNAV very much? And yes, you can program everything up, but it leaves you with nothing to do. You know, apart from operating the flaps, maybe. It's, um, it's a bit boring. So we're just coming up towards 10,000 feet. We can move the landing gear back to off now. Coming up through 10,000, so we can increase speed once we get to 10,000 feet and take this out to 320 straight away. So you can see aircraft is accelerating, so it will favour accelerating over climb rate to do that. So you can see that happening, the vector on the indicated airspeed has increased. So the little green arrow, I'm not sure what the exact number of seconds is, I think it might be 6 seconds on a 737. It tells you what speed you will be doing in 6 seconds time. I think. That'll be something to go and look up. So obviously once we get through... I'm going to use 18,000 as our reference for the changing to standard barometric pressure. I'm not sure what the transition altitude is in Australia. And I haven't got a chart here that would tell me. So we're doing 320 knots now, climbing up through 12,000, looking good. The wings wobbling. There's a fair bit of turbulence around, I think. Let's say goodbye to the Sydney Harbour. It's a lot quieter in here, isn't it? Okay, we're getting near to 18,000 now. Just keep an eye on it for a moment. the map just but while we are waiting so we've pretty much followed the flight plan to the letter so far <laughs> yeah that we're right in the middle of the track it goes 18,000 feet so we switch over to standard barometric pressure and one of the settings in the flight management computer is whether that operates on both sides or not in the real aircraft it doesn't but it's one of the things that they save you a bit of time on that you can have as a realism option where you can change the standard barometric pressure on one side and it synchronizes both sides of the cockpit. Okay, so while we're en route, we may as well go and program the ILS for Canberra. So if we go and look down here, it's 109.50348 degrees. So we'll change the course up here to 348. And over that side as well. So we're just getting things ready really. And then on the nav radios down here, we want 10950. So 10950. And switch that over. And 109. 
Let's switch that over. So we now have both nav radios tuned to the ILS. I could use auto land when we get there. Actually, let's go and check what does this ILS give us. So if we right click on this, or actually if we hover over it, it tells us that does. Yeah, here we go. Glide slope DME. Glide slope pitch three degrees. Runway direction three four eight degrees. Range. We can pick it up from twenty seven miles out. So we've pretty much got everything programmed. Okay. So just coming up towards our cruise altitude and we'll be descending again very soon. So you can see we're not going to be spending very long at 24,000. Not a very long trip today. So you can see along the coast there. So what's the area that we can see out there? So we're just passing by Lake. Now is that Illawarra? I'm guessing it is. And Shell Harbour over to the far end of it. So that's Shell Harbour that you can see down here. Lake Illawarra. What's the headland called? Kilalea Reserve. Very cool. Further down the coast in the distance you can see Kurarong apparently and the Naura military base is going to be somewhere out there in the mist. I wonder what this river is called. The twisty bits. So let's have a look at it. So if we come back up here It's on the far end of here. Can we find the name of the river? This, this map is not quite detailed. Oh, here we go. Mac Macquarie Rivulet, apparently. Goes past Calderwood. In Shell Harbour in Albion Park. Okay, how are we doing? I'm just trying to fill time really. We're at 24,000 feet, ripping along towards our top of descent, and then we'll begin descending. So let's have a look at the flight plan. I don't think we have any restrictions, we just have to be above 4,000 feet when we get to Mombi. So if we go for 5,000 feet for us, our descent as soon as we get to uh, top of descent. Take no notice of the performance data in Little Nav Map. I don't have a performance file for this aircraft, so we're relying much more on what the aircraft is telling us. So just before Razi, we'll start descending for 5,000 feet and then manage it from there. It's going to be a very, very fast trip over to Canberra. we zoom this out a little bit further you'll see yeah there's the entire end of the flight plan what you can do of course is put this in plan mode and zoom in so then you can have a good look at the, the various waypoints so at the moment if we go legs and there's Razzy and step the slick fox slow jibbil then Minzy and Mombi and that takes us into the runway yeah there's the airfield okay so if we go back into map mode and increase the range on it so we can see top of descent top of descent is coming it's 20 miles away you can 
see the rest of that flight plan curving round into the runway, so it's not very far at all. So let's get that level change ready. The aircraft does nothing with the altitude until it knows how to get there. So until I choose a vertical speed or a level change, it won't actually do anything. So I'm free to change the altitude. Yeah, the airplane's been thrown around. It's because we're over the top of hills. And Flight Simulator seems to have no um, dissipation of <laughs> turbulence. Even, you know, tens of thousands of feet above hills, they still kick you around. It's a bit of a mistake in the modelling, I guess. Of course, this is where a real commercial pilot says, oh no, at 30,000 feet, you still get kicked around by hills there. 25,000 feet below you. Actually, on the way down, let's have a play with vertical speed because then I can show you something along the way. We'll look at the anticipated height and distance. So we can start doing it now, actually. So if we go vertical speed, and you can see it's immediately gone to minus 50. So we'll come down at 1,000 feet a minute. You will notice the throttles are coming back on their own because the auto throttle is trying to maintain 320 knots, but obviously we're descending, so we're sliding downhill. So the aircraft would pick up speed if it didn't pull the throttles back. So you can see no line has appeared yet. So how fast do we need to come down? Let's go for 2,000 feet a minute. So you can see the vertical speed has come down, and here comes the line, anticipating the height we will be at. That's about right. So we need to maintain 2,000 feet a minute, but look, we're accelerating. Oh no, we're just starting to decelerate again. So with the engines... That surprises me. I mean, typically you look for about 1,800 feet a minute. I think you could probably get away with 2,500 feet a minute, but obviously it's, a, it's very inefficient if you descend quickly enough that you need to use air brakes for example then you know you're, you're using the aircraft in quite an inefficient way okay so we're now descending coming back down when we get to 18,000 we will switch the barometric pressure back over which tells us we need to find out what the barometric pressure is at Canberra so we can look at the Meta report for Canberra and you can see Q1014. So we can get that programmed in as soon as we come off of standard barometric pressure, which is 1013, so we're not far away from it. Or 2992 in American the American system. Okay, so this isn't moving around much. We can see we've got actually a 70 knot headwind, which is helping us enormously. That's probably why we're managing to hang on to this speed at a 2,000 uh, feet a minute rate, is because we're, we're blasting into a massive headwind at the moment. Once we get lower down, it'll make more, s more sense, because you think at the moment the wind is against us, but down at ground level, if we show information for Canberra, the wind is from 310 degrees at 11 knots. So it's that way. Yeah? We're experiencing the wind flying straight towards us, but at ground level, it's almost 90 degrees different. And as we come down, look into the thicker air, it's making a huge difference to us. So there we go, we changed the the um, scale to hectopascals on the barometer, which gives us these numbers that look familiar, and then we got 1014. 
So we now have the, the altimeter is registering accurately our altitude relative to the depart oh, sorry, the destination airfield. This model of the 737 has the head-up display. If you've not seen that before, there you go. That's what it looks like. So it gives you all the same data. So you've got obviously your altitude and the rates of change. You've got a velocity vector, which is quite useful. And it's actually accurate in this aircraft, unlike a lot of the other flight simulator aircraft. You've got um, indicated airspeed, Mach number, ground speed. Yeah, so it's all the information you typically need. You've also got your radio navigation information. But we don't really need it, so we're going to put it away. It's much more fun flying without it. We might put it on for landing, I guess, just to so you get some idea of the visual cues it gives you. And I'll explain as we go. Okay. So we'll reduce the range on this in a moment. Oh, we can now look because we've got at least we've got something to look at in here. So we're showing about 40 miles until we make the turn. So we can come down at a lesser angle, really. So if we have a look at the map, the, the important bit is we need to know the elevation of the airfield. So elevation is nearly 2,000 feet, so we want to be about 4,500 feet on the entry into the, the feathers. So we want 2,500 above the ground at the entrance in the feathers, and that puts us in the right place for the 3 degree glide slope. Yeah? So 4,500 feet we need to be at after completing the turn. Now we know we're going to be at 5,000 about when we reach the turn, according to this, because we're aiming for 5,000 here. So it's all looking remarkably good. As we come through 10,000 feet, we will need to decelerate back to 250 knots. So we'll start doing that now, because it might take the aircraft a little while to do it. We can obviously use the air brakes to, to help that. So obviously the throttles are coming back to idle now and the aircraft is losing speed but very very slowly so we might have to dive in and help it so i'm ready on the air brake as we speak if we're looking like we're not going to get to 250 before this gets to 10,000, i will wade in with the spoilers Obviously, as we turn that, make that final turn towards the runway, we will be losing speed all the time. And then once we get the flaps out, obviously they provide a lot of drag. And the gear as well, of course. We never turned the strobes on, did we? Whoops. It's on the checklist, I just didn't do it. We should have turned the strobes on. And we have now. Better late than never, hey. Oh, we also didn't turn off the taxi light. I mean, it turns off automatically when the wheels are retracted, but I'm not really following the procedures correctly today, am I? Mind you, we're not doing a proper flight plan either. This is just a, a fun flight between two cities and just operating the aeroplane, having a, a play with it. Now, you can see we've got a config error over here. The reason for that is I didn't turn on the centre tanks and there was fuel in the centre tanks. So now I've done that, you can see the config error has gone away. So there was fuel in the centre tanks. Okay, we've come down to 10,000 feet now. And we haven't quite got to the speed we wanted to get to, so we're going to help the aeroplane out. So I've pulled back the speed brakes, or the speed brake lever here. So I've got a physical lever that does the same trick. So you can see the speed is bleeding off. So we're a bit late with that. You shouldn't fly above 250 knots below 10,000 feet, so... I would have got into trouble for that. So 
So remember we have the ILS tuned in already. So when we make the turn towards the runway we will switch over the the mode of the screens to approach mode which will give us a course deviation indicator and the glide slope and localizer which you can also see on the attitude indicator as well to be honest. But obviously if we pull up the or pull down the, the um the display. We never turned TCAS on either. I'm not doing very well today. Serves me right for not reading the instructions. Didn't read my own checklist properly. Okay. So there we go. We we're at or coming down towards 5000, we're coming towards this final turn. If we look out sideways, can we see Canberra over there? Vaguely. Should we be able to see the runway is the question. Oh, it's further over there, I think. Yeah we've got quite a big turn to make. Okay. That sound tells us we were within 900 feet of our target altitude. So the target altitude appears at the top of the altitude ribbon. And we are over the top of hills. So this is why the altitude restriction was in place. Because you have to maintain the thousand feet separation from any hills. So where are we? Coming into Fox Low as we speak. So we need to slow down to 200 knots now. the next limit on our standard approach route. So we're just going to let the aircraft slow down gently on its own and as soon as we start making the turn we are going to start getting ready with the flaps. Now at what point can we be below 4000? So they want us until very late to be quite high, so until Mombi. So let's zoom this in again so we can see it. There's Mombi here. So we're just coming at 200 knots. We're at 5,000. So we're going to skim these hills that are nearby. So what's the radar altitude telling us? 2,000 feet. 1,900 feet. 1,800 feet. 1,700. 1600 and it's climbing again so yeah we're just skimming the hills but this is why this route is mapped in the way it is it takes us through the gaps in the hills so we're doing 200 knots now so we're going to start feeding in the flaps gently so start the flaps traveling so you'll see the needle over here begin to move it takes a while for the flaps to unfurl if we go and have a look over on the flap lever, I've gone for 2 degrees flap immediately, which has given us um, a speed limit, not one we really need to worry too much about. So we can lower the gear now, so we may as well. We're not going to get any faster now. So there goes the undercarriage. So let's go for 180 knots, make the turn nice and easy. And we can go for the next level of flaps, because by the time the flaps have travelled we will be slow enough. 
And again, any people often ask, oh, how do you know when you can get away with the flaps? It's just experience, and obviously the real pilots know the numbers off by heart. So the aircraft is travelling around the corner on autopilot still. We're going to pull the range down again so we get to see this turn mapped out for us. We're going to switch the screen over to show us approach mode. This is where it gets handy that you've got two screens here. So we can change the range on the other one. So this is now representing the runway direction relative to us and our position on the glide slope. Get the stick ready. Something else that's quite useful is these little blue markers. This is an option for the FMC. The blue line is my throttle position, so I can align my throttles with where the current amount of thrust is. So when I turn off the auto throttle, should I wish to, the engines aren't going to suddenly race or die. I'm holding them at the steady rate that they were already at. OK, so we're about to make the right turn. Let's turn the landing lights on as well while we're at it. Side, slowly configuring the aeroplane. So it will start making that turn in a moment. So we're going to go around the back of that hill by the look of it. So the aircraft is going to skim around the back of the, the hill that we could see. And then we'll see the runway out in front of us. So we're just keeping an eye on our position relative to the glide slope. So this is why it was so important to keep the altitude up. So yeah, we're actually going to cross the end of the runway for the the hill. Sorry for the um, the runway. So where is the runway? Can we see it? It's out there. Okay, so we are skimming right over the top of this hill. It'd be interesting to see how low the radar altitude gets then. So we have locked on to the localizer. So if we wanted it to now, we could switch to approach mode, which has enabled. Light slow. So the warning is just indicating that we are not on the glide slope, even though we're locked on. But approach mode won't kick in until it intercepts it, and then it will start descending on the glide slope. So why do we let the aircraft do this for us? Why don't we just turn everything off now? Turn the warnings off. And I have control. So this is where we can show you the HUD, I guess. Show you what's going on. So I'll press F. And it shows you a horizon line, and it also shows you a velocity vector. And I don't particularly like the way it does things, to be honest. So it's basically telling us where to fly. So all we have to do is chase the line. I would rather fly using these markers here.
lighting us up. There we go, here comes the glide slope. our view up so we can see where we're going. Did you also throttle come off? Yeah it did. Good. Still going a bit fast. Can throw out the spoilers, we'll get rid of some speed. This aircraft does have thrust reversers, which we can use. You're only supposed to use them until you get to about 70 knots. And then we can use the wheel brakes. And we can just roll now. So flaps are travelling back up. On the way back to the terminal, it makes sense to, if you can steer in a straight line while also operating the, operating the mouse, it makes sense to go and turn back the APU on. So we'll do that. And then you've got the APU up and running in order to cross feed over to it at the time you get to the terminal. Some airlines actually shut one of the engines down on the way back so they save fuel. We just leave them running to keep things simple. So it was a bit more eventful than I wanted to. I was messing around with the HUD and kind of lost track of looking at where we were going so that's my famous lack of multitasking skills coming to the fore. So we can go and switch those landing lights off while we're going around the corner. Oops. I can never remember which controls use the mouse wheel and which we use the switches. So we almost have to do a figure eight to get back, which is quite odd. Okay, so we just taxi down and then turn right and that takes us over towards the terminals. So the, the main terminals down the far end of the look of it. There is some parking at this end as well. So there we go, pretty standard kind of quick flight just to play around with the 737. Look at some of the controls along the way. Most of it was an autopilot. Had a bit of an unintended rush towards the landing because I was busy distracted by playing around with the head-up display, which I don't particularly like.
There's a Trilander in. Interesting. Should we come around this side? Although we'll probably slam into that Trilander if we went this side. Let's um let's go around to the left. It's an awful long way over to the terminal, isn't it? I'm gonna park over here. He won't mind me parking next to him, will he? Bit of a size difference between the pair of them. Okay. Wheel brakes on. So remember I said that we can go to the APU now, so we're going to cross-feed over to the APU because it's up and running. Which then means we can shut the engines down, and we do that by pulling the start switches back, which cuts off the fuel to the engines, and then they automatically shut down. Yeah, but we don't lose power because we've already cross-fed over to the APU, which is still running. Obviously then the shutdown sequence is basically the reverse of what we did. So it's packs off, hydraulic pumps off, you know, so on and so forth around the cockpit. I'm not going to bore you with that. You can basically do the start checklist backwards and it will take you to the same place. Okay. And there's our 737 still in one piece, thankfully. And I will see you again soon. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like the video, subscribe, click the little bell icon up in the top corner of YouTube, and it will tell you when I'm next online. Okay, I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye.